Hey guys, welcome to topic two in chapter 16. In this topic, we're going to talk about some examples of these receptors we've been talking about. And we're going to talk specifically about G-protein -cou coupled receptors. You'll hear me talk about them as GPCRs for short. So this topic, we're going to talk about what are GPCRs, what they do, and then we're going to talk about um, some examples of how GPCRs work. Here's our topic objectives. Now, there's only four of them, but they're kind of tricky because they're very broad. I basically need you to know the main processes and the main functions of all everything we're going to talk about here with GPCRs. So what is a G-protein coupled receptor? So it's important to not get this confused. The GPCR is this green thing that you see right here on your slide. It is a seven transmembrane protein. You can see those seven pass-throughs. And it, take a moment and think for yourself if you could think and see if you can remember how that gets embedded in the membrane. See if you remember that from unit three. And it has a receptor end on the outside of the cell in that extracellular space. You can see that there. And that's where the signal will bind. The inside part of the GPCR is what's going to actually activate the G proteins. And you can see that over here on our right hand side. We have three G proteins. We have alpha, beta, and gamma. And those are inactivated normally. And then once a signal is received by the receptor protein, these will become activated. Now it's important to know that alpha will always stay on its, will be activated on its own, while beta and gamma will always have a complex. Beta does not go and act on its own, and gamma does not go and act on its own. It's always the activated beta gamma complex. So let's look at an example of how these work. So you can see here that just like I talked about, the GPCRs are always going to activate the G subunits. And once again, we have three subunits. We have alpha, beta, and gamma. And remember, beta and gamma are always a partner. And these actions are always going to come from subunits and not the receptor. That green receptor we just talked about is all it does is pass along the signal. It just begins a signal transduction pathway. So in, this is important for you to understand. And this is always going to start off with alpha subunit having the ability to uh, hydrolyze the GTP to the GDP. You can see that here, where the alpha subunit has the G, an active GTP. Once it's hydrolyzed, it's going to go to GDP and become an inactivated protein. And then the whole complex will come back together so that the um, complex can then be reactivated the next time the signal is received. So it's important that you understand how this works. So beta and gamma will always work together and alpha has the ability to hydrolyze GTP to help it um, to help it activate. So let's look at an example here. This is a really basic example and then we're going to go through it a lot more in depth. So we start with the GPCR being activated by acetylcholine, which is one of our favorite um, signals at this point, and it's going to activate the three branches. And what you can see here is the activated alpha subunit has its GTP is activated, but the beta gamma complex at this point is going to go move to these closed potassium channels. And this is in a heart example. It's going to activate these potassium channels, allowing potassium to pass through and it's going to change the excitability of the cell and slow down the heartbeat. And this is accomplished through the beta gamma complex. Once this is done, the beta gamma complex is going to come back together with the alpha and, it, and the alpha will hydrolyze that GTP becoming an inactive G protein complex again with alpha, beta, and gamma waiting for the next signal to be received by the cell. Now it's important to remember that that GPCR can stay activated for a while and will activate a whole lot of these G proteins. It's not always just um, one off signal or one a one off event. So here's another example and this is where the alpha subunit is actually going to do the activating. And in this case we're going to activate an enzyme. So what happens is once again the GPCR is going to receive that signal, pass the signal across the membrane to these G proteins. The alpha subunit is going to become active and the beta gamma subunit will be activated as well and it may have a different function but the, at this point we're just focusing on what alpha is going to do. Alpha is going to travel to an enzyme and it's going to activate this enzyme. And what this enzyme is going to do is it's going to turn on and create more secondary messengers. So this is, a, this is that second example when we talked about the signal transduction pathways is that this is going to pass on that signal some more. And these secondary messengers are going to go and act in intracellular proteins in a variety of ways depending on what they are. 
So we're going to walk through a couple examples of them now to um, so make sure you understand these two basic examples until, because we're going to get into some complicated ones here shortly. So feel free to pause the recording and go back over these last two before you move on. All right. So the first thing we're going to talk about is cyclic AMP. Sometimes you'll see it abbreviated as CAMP. So CAMP is a very important secondary messenger, and it, it works a lot with GPCRs. And it, it, there's other um, roles it has in the body as well. It's not just tied to GPCRs, but cyclic AMP is a huge role. So what cyclic AMP is, and you can see this here in this picture on your slide, it's this middle molecule that has this triangle-shaped uh, structure on the side of it. That's the cyclic AMP. So what happens is adenyl cyclase will take ATP, remove two of the phosphates, and then it creates this weird little side structure of cyclic AMP. Once the cyclic AMP signal is done being used, it'll be transformed back into AMP by, uh, by cyclic AMP phosphodiesterase. So it's the secondary messenger that'll be utilized by the cell for what it needs to be, and then it'll be deactivated. And you can see that there's a lot of cell responses that are mediated by the cyclic AMP, and you can see some examples here on the slide. So make sure you have a good handle on what cyclic AMP is. Really, at the end of the day, it is a secondary messenger in the cell, and it performs a whole lot of, mess um, a whole lot of duties. So let's look at an example of where C of cyclic AMP is used with the GPCR. So you can see two examples here on this slide, and it's um, don't worry so much about the out the outcome of them. I just want you to realize that there are a variety of outcomes that can happen, and it all depends on the signal. It all depends on what the cell needs to do. So in this case, both both times the GPCR is going to be activated here by adrenaline. Adrenaline's going to turn on the GPCR. The PCR is then going to the GPCR is then going to activate the alpha subunit of the G proteins. This alpha subunit is going to travel to the activated adenyl cyclase, which is the enzyme in this case. The enzyme is going to transform ATP into cyclic AMP, and the cyclic AMP is then going to travel to an inactive phosphokinase or protein kinase. In this case, it's protein kinase A. The protein kinase is going to be activated by the cyclic AMP, and then it is going to allow this protein kinase to travel to its target and create an action. And as you can see, there's two different actions here. One is it's going to start transcription. The other one is it's going to trigger, to trigger glycogen breakdown. So you can see how this same process can allow for different things to happen within the cell. So it's really important they understand that. Be prepared to be able to discuss these examples in class, guys. So let's talk about another secondary molecule. This is the inositol phospholipid pathway. And this is, uh, the secondary molecule is inositol phospholipid. It's activated by phospholipase C. And we're going to go through an example of this one here in just a second. But notice here, this one also has a variety of responses possible within the cell. So let's look at an example of this. In this example, we have the signal molecule binding to the activated GPCR. Once again, in this example, we're going to activate the alpha subunit. But remember, beta gamma can be activated just as well um, in any of these uh, in any case. But in this case, we're looking at alpha. Alpha subunit is going to activate the phospholipase C, which is going to travel over here to the inositol phospholipid. What happens at this point is the pho inositol phospholipid is going to be cleaved into two parts. The inositol 145 triphosphate, it's always abbreviated IP3, so you'll see that listed in a variety of places, IP3. And then diacylglycerol, which is going to activate a P, uh, protein kinase C. So what happens is this IP3 can travel to the endoplasmic reticulum and release calcium into the cell. Calcium, as we've talked about throughout the semester, has a huge role in the cell and in functions. And you know, it's as I say in class, it's a bit, it's a big part of how we get up in the morning. So it's really important to understand that. In fact, if you're struggling looking for something to reflect in your journal about this chapter, I would take a look at the calcium and the little short discussion your textbook has on the role of calcium and see if there's something there that triggers a good journal entry for you to reflect on. So in this case, this is, shows you just how an acetyl triphosphate can also stimulate a variety of functions within the cell, and this is just one example with the calcium channel. So let's wrap up our chat here on GPCRs. It, we just spent, you know, about 10 minutes or so talking about GPCRs. In that period of time, your cells 
have used these receptors to signal to have a signal trans uh, to pass signal transduction pathways throughout your cell very quickly. This has happened over and over and over again in the time that it's taken you to watch this. In fact, having this happen is what helped you learn this material. These signals can be amplified. They can trigger, trigger secondary responses. There's a variety of things. Remember, it's all those functions we talked about in topic one. And the signal cascades can adapt from feedback loops to, and it amplifies or reduces that signal. So if they even get the signal and the cell says, no, 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 we don't need to do that, it'll back down that signal transduction. It doesn't, it's not this thing that once it starts, it can't be stopped. Feedback loops play a huge role in this. And it's one of our, many of our basic senses and just allowing you to watch this presentation, as I just said, come from GPCRs. So I can't really understate how important GPCRs are. So make sure you understand how they work and the purpose of them before you move on to the next topic. And as always, if you have any questions, please let me know.